towards the end of chapter 28 of the Quran, that Surah Al Qasas, Allah Azza wa tells us a story that He does not tell us anywhere else in the Quran, and that is the story of Qarun. Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Inna Qarun kana min qawmi Musa tabla alayhim." Indeed, Qarun was from the people of Moses, but he tyrannized them. Several of the Salaf, including Abdullah ibn Abbas, Ibrahim al nahai and Qatada, said that Qarun was a cousin of Musa alayhi salam. A cousin. Now, that was a surprising little fact to me the first time I learned it, as I'm sure it might be surprising to you. And the reason it is surprising is that we assume that cousins would have loyalty towards one another. We assume that they would be on the same side. We even have an Arabic saying from Jahiliyyah, My brother and I against my cousin, my cousin and I against the stranger. That saying indicates that even in a culture where rivalry and enmity are the norm, you should at least be able to rely on your cousin's help against an outsider. So how could Qarun both be the cousin of Musa and at the same time a tyrant over Musa's people? The answer is that Qarun was employed by none other than Fir'aun himself. Qarun was the overseer. He kept Bani Israel in mind. And as a reward, he was paid handsomely. Allah Azza wa Jal says that we gave him treasures whose keys would burden a group of strong men. That's how rich he was. There are several lessons here for us already to consider. First, your proximity to greatness does not automatically make you great. Your proximity to piety and to righteousness does not automatically make you pious or righteous. It might help you. It might be a good influence on you. But at the end of the day, you have to choose to follow in the footsteps of those around you or not. Allah Azza wa Jal gives us examples of this consistently throughout the Qur'an. We have Ibrahim alayhi salam and his father, Nuh alayhi salam and his son, Luh alayhi salam and his wife. Their proximity to prophethood did not help them at all because they chose not to follow those prophets. They chose not to allow themselves to be transformed by their guidance. Sometimes as people of faith, sometimes as Muslims, we are happy, we are content with simply being in the proximity of guidance. We keep the Qur'an up on a shelf, collecting dust. We name our children after prophets. We have certain cultural things that we follow. But where is the transformation? We have to choose to be transformed by the guidance of the prophets. That is what means what it means to be a believer. Another lesson to consider from the story of Qarun, and particularly the fact that Qarun was a cousin of Musa, alayhi salam, is the weakness of tribalism and nationalism as a method of organization and solidarity. Allah Azza wa Jal says, commenting about the coalition of forces that fought against the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, بَأْسُهُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ شَدِيدٌ تَحْسَبُهُمْ جَمِيعًا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ شَكْتَى Their infighting is severe. You might think that they're united, but in reality their hearts are far apart. And the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam warned us about rallying behind identities that didn't have to do with our chosen faith. Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in Allah qad adhaba ankum ubriyat al-jabiliyya wa fakhraha bil-aba mu'minun taqiyun wa fajirun shaqiyun antum banu adam wa adam min turab la yada'anna rijalun fakhrahum bi-aqwam innama hum fahmun min fahmi jahannam. 
He said, surely Allah Azawajal has rid you of your pre-Islamic arrogance and your pride in your forefathers. There are only God-fearing believers or wretched sinners. You are descendants of Adam, and Adam is from dirt. Men will certainly call to their pride in their nation. I tell you, it's only a coal from the hellfire. In North America, we are encouraged to identify and organize ourselves along these lines, whether it's your nationality, or your ethnicity, or your race, or your skin color. And it is true that these parts of our identity are factors that account for our different experiences in life. No one can deny that. In North America, a person with black skin is not treated the same as a person with white skin. We can't say that we're colorblind and ignore that reality, but at the same time, we can't take those parts of our identity and make them a priority over our faith, over our deen. And we cannot make those parts of our identity the main thing that we are rallying around. Because the theological issue here is that Islam came to establish a true meritocracy. And meritocracy is based on your choices. Did you choose to be black? Did you choose to be white? Did you choose to be an Arab or Pakistani or Burmese? If you didn't choose it, then taking too much pride in it is foolish. Allah doesn't care. He cares about the decisions that you make, the principles that you live by, and the virtue that you develop within yourself, which is why he said, Subhana, inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaqum. In Allah Alimun Khabir. Certainly, the most noble of you to Allah is the one who is the most pious. Another lesson to consider here is the importance of unity. If a people are united, it is much harder to oppress them. Once their ranks are broken and split, once they're afflicted with division and infighting, then it's very easy to conquer them. Allah Azza wa says in the Qur'an that the believers have to unite. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوهُ تَكُونُ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ كَبِيرٌ The deniers are allies of one another. If you don't do likewise, there will be great fitna on earth and great corruption. In the case of Bani Israel, Qarun is the one who broke ranks. Qarun is the one who opened up the door to make it easier to oppress Bani Israel. And a corollary to this lesson of being united is that it is essential that we develop ourselves ethically. Meaning, unity is not possible without discipline. Unity is not possible without ethical standards. If you aren't working for Allah, if you haven't tamed your wants and your desires, it will be very easy to bribe you. It will be very easy to tempt you. Or at least it will be very easy to distract you from your duty. This is a crucial lesson for us as Muslims, especially our Muslim youth. We need you. The Ummah needs you. We need Muslim lawyers. We need Muslim politicians, Muslim authors. We need Muslim activists. We want our youth to aspire to be leaders so that they can contribute to society and make the world a better place. But before you find yourself in a position of leadership, you have to tame your nerves. You have to tame your ego. You have to purify yourself. If not, you might end up doing more harm than good. A few months ago, it came to light that Black Lives Matter not the mass movement, but the official organization spent over $12 million of donation money on luxury properties in LA and Toronto where they threw big parties for people. A few years back when George Floyd was murdered and people's frustrations boiled over, Black Lives Matter became the leaders of the racial justice movement in the United States. 
Their name and their slogan became synonymous with the movement itself. Chapters sprung up everywhere across the country. They enjoyed massive support, influence, and fame. As an organization, they collected $90 million in donations in the year of 2020. But you can only go so far as your discipline takes you. Now people are asking questions. Now their credibility is damaged. Now people are going to be less likely to trust them. Their opponents will take this opportunity to undermine the principles of the organization. It will become an obstacle towards achieving any of their goals in the future, and they did it to themselves. These are lessons for those who take heed. If you want to make a difference in this world, good for you. Start now. Start now by working on yourself. You need to be ready to refuse a bribe. You need to be able to say no to evil. You need to be able to do the right thing when no one else is looking. If you can't do that, you're not ready for leadership. Alhamdulillah ala ihsan wa shukr lahu ala tafriqihi wa amtinani wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahtadu la sharika lah ta'lima min shahmi wa ashadu anna nabiyyana wa sayyidina Muhammad al-abduhu wa rasuluhu wa da'i ila radwani sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahabihi wa ikhwani wa sallimu tasliman kathira As Allah Azza wa Jal tells the story of Qarun He mentions the reaction of Bani Israel to Qarun's enormous wealth and power. You had one group warning him, <laughs> Thereupon his people said to him, Don't be proud. Indeed, Allah does not like those who are proudful. <laughs> وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ وَلَا تَبَغِ الْفَسَادَ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُفْسِدِينَ Seek, they say to Qarun, seek through that which Allah has given you, the home of the hereafter, but don't forget your share of this world and do good, just like Allah has done good to you, and don't desire corruption in the land. Indeed, Allah does not love those who corrupt. A lesson we can take here concerns the nature of wealth. Is money really the root of all evil? Like some people say it is. No. Allah Azza tells us through Bani Israel that is not the case. Money is simply a tool. It can be used for good and it can be used for evil. Here Bani Israel is begging Qarun to use it for good. They tell him that it's actually the means by which he can obtain paradise. Once you've used your wealth to secure your spot in paradise, they tell him, then worry about your dunya. Allah Azza wa Jalla is teaching us priorities. Some of us have our priorities mixed up and backwards. We think, once I'm established, then I'll give charity. Once I'm established, then I'll go on hajj. Once I'm established, then I'll give to the masjid. No, no, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to do the opposite. Worry about your afterlife first. Then you can worry about your halal fun in the dunya. Qarun does not respond in the best way to this advice. He says, قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيْتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي أَوَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَحْلَكَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ he said, I was only given all of this wealth because of the knowledge I have. Did he not know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had destroyed before him generations who were greater than him in power and greater in wealth? 
Harun commits the cardinal sin of idolizing the secondary causes that Allah Azza wa Jalla has created. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate cause of everything and He has created the universe to adhere to the laws of cause and effect. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reigns supreme over everything. He gets to decide if the causes bring about the results or not. An arrogant heart will want to believe that the causes themselves are independent of Allah. Of course I've got so much wealth, thinks Qawmin. It's because of how smart I am. This is an appealing way to think because worldly causes don't ask anything from you. They don't ask that you be grateful. They don't ask that you follow certain rules. If someone, on the other hand, recognizes that Allah Azawajal decides whether your intelligence results in success or failure, ah, then you have to work. Then you have to strive to please Allah, and you have to do what He says. Not everyone from Bani Israel had such wise advice for Qarun. Some people were star-struck by his wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, so Qarun came out before his people and he was dressed to the nines. He was all decked out in all of his adornment. And those who desired the worldly life, they looked and they said, If only we had wealth like Qarun. Indeed, look at how fortunate this man is. Another crucial lesson, some of Bani Israel misinterpret the fact that Qarun is wealthy. They see him and they assume that his wealth is an indication that he's doing something right. This is the same mistake that our kids make when they see athletes and entertainers, the highest paid people in our society, and they want to be just like them. They imitate their clothes, they imitate their hairstyle, they imitate their way of speaking. Why? Just because they have money. If you ask little boys when they, what they want to be when they get older, most of them will say some sort of athlete. I guarantee you that that would not be the case if being an athlete did not come with money and fame. How do we know that their wealth is not a test? How do we know that their wealth is not a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah tells us what prevents us from considering that possibility is loving the world too much, is being too attached to this world. When you're too attached to this world, Allah's approval really comes second. It takes a back seat to getting what you want out of the dunya. Not everyone from Bani Israel falls for this. The scholars, they see things clearly. Allah says, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ وَيْلَكُمْ ثَوَابُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لِمَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِنَ صَالِحًا وَلَا يُلَقَاهَا إِلَّا الصَّابِرُونَ But those who had been given knowledge, they said, Woe to you guys! The reward of Allah is better for he who believes and does righteousness, and none are granted that except for the patient. One lesson we notice here is the importance of the scholarly class and how they fit into the broader community of believers. Sometimes people have the wrong idea. Sometimes people have inappropriate expectations. Some people expect the Imam to make them feel good about every single thing that they're already doing. What's the point of that? Do you really expect to never get any pushback? Do you really expect to never be given advice? even if you don't want to hear it. Islamic scholars are supposed to have the longest view in the room. They're supposed to push back against the short-sightedness of others and challenge conventional wisdom. If they didn't do that, we would become prisoners to every single fad and trend that came down the pipeline. The scholars are supposed to provide a certain amount of gravity, a certain amount of caution, and that's not to excuse scholars who are 
out of touch or scholars who are insensitive, but we also can't expect scholars to give us a rubber stamp of approval for absolutely everything that we think or feel. In this scenario, the scholars see something that the other people can't. They see that Qarun's wealth and status was a punishment, not a blessing. It was building the case against Qarun. It was proving his arrogance and his ingratitude. And sure enough, it was only a matter of time until it all came crashing down. Allah says, فَخَسَفْنَا بِهِ فما كان له من فئة ينصرونه من دون الله وما كان من المنتصرين and we caused the earth to swallow him and his home and there was for him no company to aid him other than Allah nor could he defend himself what a horrible way to go dying in arrogance and dying in ingratitude Finally, the people realized what was really going on. And those who had wished for his position just the other day began to say, Oh, how Allah extends provision to whom he wills of his servants and restriction. If Allah had not favored us, he would have caused it to swallow us up too. Oh, how the deniers don't succeed. Yesterday they wanted to be just like Harun. Today, not so much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the story by telling us the real reason for their enduring success. It's not wealth. It's not status. That home of the hereafter, we only assign to those who do not desire exaltedness upon this earth, nor corruption. And the best outcome is reserved for the righteous. Humility, righteousness, piety. These are the ingredients for true and lasting success.